evening pleasure, the Baker Street players of Baker Street West present The Legacy, A Golden Evening. But first, a word from our sponsors. To admirers of Sherlock Holmes and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the Deerstalker at Baker Street West will evoke your last trek through the Devonshire Moors and tantalize you with a considerable Sherlockian inventory on offer there. Wonderful books, old and new, handmade keepsakes of the most unusual origins, vintage prints, and collectibles suitable for any lover of Sherlock Holmes all await you in the Deerstalker. You need not have concerns about your safety. For some time now, all hounds have been banished from the premises. Plan your visit soon to the Deerstalker at Baker Street West, a Victorian London neighborhood straight from the tales of Sherlock Holmes, located in historic Jackson, California. Open weekends at Baker Street West, where the game is always afoot. Mrs. Hudson's Tea Shop is a testament to Mrs. Hudson's talent with tea. She has secured an impressive variety of quality teas from around the world, convenient tea accessories, and beautiful vintage china for sale to the most discerning clientele, all the while tending to the very worst tenant in London. Mrs. Hudson never complains about Mr. Holmes's music at strange hours, his occasional revolver practice within doors, his weird and malodorous scientific experiments, and the most appalling characters who invade her ground floor flat. Mrs. Hudson's Tea Shop should be your first stop at Baker Street West, a Victorian London neighborhood straight from the tales of Sherlock Holmes, located in historic Jackson, California. And sometimes Mrs. Hudson has delicious samples to offer. Open weekends at Baker Street West, where the game is always afoot. What happened at this very table in 1889 changed the face of literature. The name Sherlock Holmes would most likely not be known to the majority of us without this setting. Can you imagine a world without the great detective? I certainly cannot. Are you a bit skeptical? <laughs> what fantastic tale is this, you think? A bit of theater, perhaps? I can assure you that what transpired here did indeed change the face of literature and thus ensure the legacy that became Sherlock Holmes. I should be delighted to share with you what transpired at that most auspicious gathering. For you see, while not a guest that afternoon, I was a part of the hotel staff who took care of the details of their meal. They met here at the elegant Langham Hotel. This hotel has stood the test of time ever since His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales officially opened the Langham. As you enter through the columned portico, you must notice the ornate wrought iron balconies, the beautiful French windows, and the towering sandstone facade, much as our esteemed guests did that day in August. What brought them together, you might ask? It all began with an invitation from Joseph Marshall Stoddard, an American who was the managing editor of Livencott's monthly magazine. Mr. Stoddard had traveled from Philadelphia to London for the express purpose of starting a British edition of the magazine, for he had hopes of luring the best and brightest authors in the British Isles to write for his publication. One of his guests, was a young Irish writer named Oscar Wilde. Now young Oscar had already made a bit of a name for himself with his ostentatious wit and personality. Mr. Wilde was employed at the time by another magazine, Women's Weekly, as a poet and essayist. His writing style had a reputation for being slightly, shall we say, scandalous. A bit of a dandy in his appearance, Mr. Wilde was a vocal member of the avant-garde who promoted art for art's sake. Another guest Mr. Stoddard contacted was based on the advice of the wife of a fellow editor who had read A Study in Scarlet 
and had been captivated by the detective who took a scientific approach to crime solving. So Arthur Conan Doyle was invited to join them. Now Arthur Conan Doyle was a young Scottish physician whose practice was struggling, which made Mr. Stoddard's invitation easy for Mr. Doyle to accept. It gave him an opportunity to leave his cramped little surgery in Portsmouth and enjoy a sumptuous luncheon in a spacious hotel in the cultured city of London. There can hardly be two more contrasting authors of the era than Arthur Conan Doyle and Oscar Wilde. Mr. Doyle was a bit stodgy, albeit a bit of a statesman, who considered his every word and then, on the other hand, Mr. Wilde, a creative and flamboyant genius who adored the sound of his own voice. Ah, Mr. Wilde, how wonderful to meet you. The pleasure is all mine, Mr. Stollard. Mr. Doyle, it is a pleasure. And to you too. Uh, gentlemen, uh, please join me. I must say I am truly delighted by your company today. My journey across the Atlantic has not been in vain, for I feel in my very bones that this is to be a momentous and happy occasion. And, may I say, I hope it will be fortuitous as well. <laughs> it gives great pleasure to know I have bought you some modicum of happiness. Some cause happiness wherever they go, others whenever they leave. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a long axiom of mine that the little things are infinitely the most important. Who is to say that a bit of happiness is not chief among them? I must say, I quite agree with your perceptive observations. You each have a way with words which is known to me. How wonderful to start our time together in such a fashion. Well, thank you, Mr. Stoddard, for your kind invitation, which I am most delighted to accept. A confession, however, is due on my part. The opportunity to meet you, Mr. Doyle, did come with a bit of excitement. For I have read your book, Micah Clark, and found it to my liking. Excellent! So you are acquainted with each other's work. How marvelous to know that while your styles are so unique and your viewpoints so vastly different, you enjoy each other's work. But you like my work, M Micah Clark, Mr. Wilde, is quite flattering. I must admit to being surprised. Pray, tell me, sir, what engaged your attention in my little story? Ah, a challenge, as there was so much that piqued my interest. Uh, to start with, your depiction of George Jeffries hit the mark for me, truly. A rather brilliant bully, handsome of course, but with a flaw. You see, every saint has a past and every sinner a future, the sort of character I search for in a good book. If one cannot enjoy reading a book over and over again, there is no use reading it at all. I found the judge a most satisfying sort to portray in my pages. It is a challenge to find the right note when it comes to historical persons. For other characters, under such circumstances, I generally gravitated to London, that great cesspool into which all loungers and idlers of the empire irresistibly drained. Morality in life can be a difficult pursuit, but a pursuit not without valor. Quite true, Mr. Doyle. Those who find ugly meanings and beautiful things are corrupt without being charming. This is a fact. Those who find beautiful meanings and beautiful things are cultivated. For these, there is hope. They are the elect to whom beautiful things mean only beauty. There is no such thing as a moral or immoral book. Books are well written or badly written. That is all. Your Micah Clark, Mr. Doyle, is out of the former. Well written. I quite agree with Mr. Wilde on his observation, Mr. Doyle. And I would like to add that your study in Scarlet met that very same criteria. American readers were quite taken with your Sherlock Holmes. Ah, perfect timing. Uh, thank you. Gentlemen, may I tempt you with some wine? An excellent idea, Mr. Stoddard, for I can resist anything except temptation. You must join us, Mr. Doyle. The only way to get rid of temptation is to yield to it. <laughs> <laughs> A toast. Ah, uh, uh, if I may be so bold, Mr. Stoddard. May I? To living. As to live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people exist. That is all. So a toast to living. To, to living. living. 
A most clever toast, Mr. Wilde. Ah, yes. I'm so clever that sometimes I don't understand a single word of what I am saying. Mmm, <laughs> what a delectable aroma. I couldn't imagine a better meal. Uh, tell me, Mr. Doyle, in your books thus far, you seem to pen from real life. Do you find that more intriguing than fantasy? My dear fellow, life is infinitely stranger than anything which the mind of man could invent. We would not dare to conceive the things which are real, mere commonplaces of existence. If we could fly out that window, hand in hand, hover over this great city, gently remove the roofs, and peep in at the queer things which are going on, the strange coincidences, the plannings, the cross-purposes, the wonderful chains of events working through generations and leading to the most outré results. It would make all the fiction with its conventionalities and foreseen conclusions most stale and unprofitable. Well said. I quite agree. My own life, for instance, is wrought with such strange coincidences and cross-purposes to make quite an entertaining book. In fact, I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read in the train. <laughs> Very creative, Mr. Doyle. To take real life and mix it with imagination to form your story. By using a bit of imagination, one can take the reader on a journey that tingles the senses. And of course, where there is no imagination, there is no horror. Mm. It has always been my habit to hide none of my methods, either from my friends or from anyone who might take intelligent interest in them, for they too might discover the truth. The truth is rarely pure and rarely simple. Remember this, a thing is not necessarily true because a man dies for it. So, always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them so much. <laughs> Mr. Wilde, I hardly expect that you have many enemies. Eh, perhaps. I do have many friends, however, and a good friend will always stab you in the front. <laughs> A rather morbid thought, Mr. Wilde. A change of direction, perhaps. Uh, tell me, what are your aspirations beyond what you've already accomplished? I am a dreamer. For a dreamer is one who can only find his way by moonlight. And his punishment is that he sees the dawn before the rest of the world. However, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Our conversation has been delightful but I am sure you are both curious as to the purpose of my invitation today. As you are aware, no doubt, I am an editor and publisher for Lippincott's Monthly in Philadelphia. It is our desire at Lippincott's to publish a new magazine here in England that will appeal to a British reader. Searching for writers who are of a certain caliber is my current focus on this trip. On the excellent advice of one of my editors, I have read some of your works your imagination and creative turn of phrase is well known, Mr. Wilde. Mr. Doyle, your detective, Mr. Holmes, is, is a favorite among American readers, and having him reappear in our magazine here would be most appropriate. To that end, I would like to offer you both an opportunity to write for Lippincott's British edition. I want to give our readers something to talk about, and I believe you gentlemen can do just that. What do you say to my proposal? Oh, but I am too fond of reading books to write them. <laughs> Mr. Stoddard, your author is a most intriguing one. There's only one thing in life worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. I do believe I shall take you up on your offer. To take a different path than Mr. Doyle, I do believe I shall craft something a bit more fantastical. My brain is abuzz with ideas, and I look forward to expanding a thought beyond the columns I am currently writing for Women's Weekly. Splendid! Splendid! I very much look forward to reading what your pen brings forth, as it is sure to leave its imprint on the imagination of our readers. What say you, Mr. Doyle? Another Sherlock Holmes adventure, perhaps? Another mystery, eh, Mr. Stoddard? I might be able to grant such a request. As a man should keep his little brain attic stocked with all the furniture he is likely to use, and the rest he can put away in the lumber room of his library, where he can get it if he wants. And I am compelled to admit that, having my pen in hand, I do begin to realize the matter must be presented in such a way that may interest the reader. 
I do like a challenge, and I am grateful for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Stardust. You have found yourself another writer. Excellent! As gentlemen, you have made this evening not only quite jovial and stimulating, but I am sure it will pr prove to be one that secures the success of Lippincott's newest magazine. A toast! Mr. Stardust was quite correct in his prediction of Lippincott's success in England. The success of the evening went much further, however. Both authors were commissioned to write 45,000 words for the magazine at the princely sum of 100 pounds. Mr. Wilde wrote his infamous The Picture of Dorian Gray. What tale will my pen create? To the world I seem, by intention on my part, a dilettante and dandy merely. It is not wise to show one's heart to the world. Perhaps this time I just might. Art for art's sake, my credo. But art is not always innocent, as it can do violence. The direction to take should address just this, as diversity of opinion about a work of art shows that the work is new, complex, and vital. If you take away morality, how deep is the abyss man would sink? For all excess, as well as all renunciation, brings its own punishment. Thus, my little fairy tale be part comedy of manners, of which I know some little about, part horror to heighten the senses, and part treatise on the relationship between art and morality, for good measure. One person is too torn between a refined aesthete and a coarse criminal. I do believe this will give the masters a great deal to talk about. Oh, and talk they did. The picture of Dorian Gray caused a scandal with its classic gothic horror story of decadence and self-destruction. A foreshadow of Oscar Wilde's own life path? Perhaps. When it was first published in Lippincott's in July of 1890, the English public considered it quite unclean, poisonous, and heavy with the metaphytic odors of moral and spiritual putrefaction. Americans, however, were not scandalized. Wilde would add another six chapters to the picture of Dorian Gray before it was published as a hardbound edition. Thus, another 28,000 words were added to the original story that had been published in Lippincott's magazine. In an effort to make his novel more palatable, for English readers, Mr. Wilde changed the pacing of his first rendering of the fairy tale of Dorian Gray and not for the better. Within five years, Mr. Wilde would find himself convicted of gross indecency and sentenced to prison for two years' hard labor. Upon his release from prison, Mr. Wilde left for Paris, never to return to England. He would continue to write, but never again under his own name. His death at the age of 46 found him destitute. For Arthur Conan Doyle, however, the meeting begat the second tale of the great detective Sherlock Holmes. And so the Holmes legacy was born. For Lippincott's magazine, Mr. Doyle would pen the sign of the fall. Sherlock Holmes. Where do I take him next? Can he be defined? Perhaps not. But I shall endeavor to embrace the challenge of breathing life into him once again. For the reader must be stimulated in heart and intellect with the human drama unfolding on the page. To concoct a story fit for Mr. Holmes, the plot needs to be complex, with turns that take bizarre twist, leaving the reader no choice but to go to the next page. Perhaps taking excitement that leaves the pulses racing in a shootout on the Thames, and a poison dart blowpipe to give the story an exotic titillation would be the right direction. Is Holmes a hero? If so, he's a bit unsufferable, but definitely brilliant. In one month's time, Arthur Conan Doyle would complete The Sign of the Four, which was published in Lippincott's Monthly in February 1890. In this adventurous tale, we learn more of the great detective Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John Watson, who have grown in personality and foibles with the first mention of Holmes' cocaine use and his 7% solution, and Watson's romance with Mary Morstan. The Langham Hotel made its first appearance in the Sherlockian canon in The Sign of the Four, as Captain Morstan stayed here as a guest. Mr. Stoddard's dinner party thus ensured the legacy of Mr. Holmes, who continues to live in our imaginations today 
and where he will never die. All in all, a golden evening, as Mr. Doyle would refer to it in years to come. Let me thank you again for joining me this evening. I look forward to working with you in the future. Uh, more wine, gentlemen. I shall look back at our first encounter with great fondness, as I know you will always be fond of me. I represent all the sins you never had the courage to commit. This is the truth. You have eliminated the impossible. Whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. lost something and cannot find it. Perhaps you suspect someone but have no proof. Perhaps there exists no mystery in your life, but you are in dire need of diversion. The solution awaits you at Baker Street West, a Victorian London neighborhood straight from the tales of Sherlock Holmes, located in historic Jackson, California. Bring your close friends, bring your family, and bring your problem for an entertaining consultation with the world's first consulting detective, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and of course, Dr. John Watson. Held in Baker Street West's remarkable recreation of 221B Baker Street. Lack a problem? No worries. A problem can be created for you. The fee for consultations begins at $50 and may include Mrs. Hudson's famous tea and refreshments, Fees benefit Baker Street West, a non-profit arts organization. To arrange for your consultation, please message Mrs. Hudson at info at bakerstreetwest.com or telephone 209-223-2215. Baker Street West, where the game is always afoot. you are shy or are you overwhelmed by going out during these uncertain days perhaps you are in need of counsel and don't know where to turn letters to Sherlock Holmes is a splendid alternative to a consultation with Sherlock Holmes simply write your inquiry down slip it into an envelope with a check for five dollars and send it to Baker Street West 204 Main Street Jackson California 95642 attention mrs hudson or email mrs hudson at info at bakerstreetwest.com and she will give you instructions on how to pay five dollars by paypal you will in due time receive a response from the world's greatest consulting detective and your query if proving to be an interesting one might even be presented on our next podcast baker street west where the game is always afoot. The Legacy, A Golden Evening, written and directed by Beth Bernard, with the voice talents of Joe Sveck as J.M. Stoddard, Sid Cohen as Arthur Conan Doyle, Topher Anderson as Oscar Wilde, and Beth Bernard as the narrator. Sound tech by Roger Fougere, Foley crew Amanda Reese and Priscilla Sveck, original score by David Vasquez, a production of Baker Street West, where the game is always afoot.